I'd like to introduce Samantha Smith. Samantha is the director of the Just Transition Center. The center supports communities, cities, countries, and companies on their transition. Franz Joseph uh, Wodopia is the managing director of Coal Importers Association from Germany. Jay Witherell is a former South Australian premier who can tell us about the transition to renewable energy in South Australia. And Alan Thompson from Global Energy Systems. Uh, he's a leader there uh, at ARUP and he has worked with many communities around the world which are facing this transition. So Samantha, I'll hand over to you uh, for your 10 minutes and okay. we'll have a discussion following, following that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and to learn from the work that you're doing here in Taranaki and in New Zealand more broadly. But I want to start by giving my greetings and acknowledgement to local iwi and ha here in Taranaki for the warmth of your welcome today. That was really a special moment for me this morning. I recognize that we are meeting on your land. I want to thank you for your welcome. And I bring you greetings from the international trade union movement. And since I live in Norway, the Norwegian Trade Union Confederation and the Labour Party's sister party in Norway, Arbeiderpartia. So thank you very much. I was in New Zealand last year in connection with the first Just Transition Summit, which was hosted by CTU Renunga and the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. And the co-convener of CTU Renunga, Loris Park, started the conference with this saying, which really stuck with me as a way to talk about Just Transition. Without vision and foresight, the people will be lost. And that really is what we're doing here today and what we're doing in Just Transition globally. As your Prime Minister said this morning, it's about planning for things that are happening right now, but also for things that are going to happen in the future, planning for the next generation and not just the next election. It's going to be a process, maybe over several decades, as we're going to hear from some of the co-panelists, of transforming a sector, a region, an economy, both here in New Zealand and also globally. And New Zealand, I've been asked to say some things about the international perspective, and they're mostly going to reinforce what you've already heard because everything that we're hearing about the roadmap, the process for building it, very bottom up, uh, some of the steps the government is taking, and also the attempts to have a strong role for First Nations, for indigenous people, and to recognize their sovereignty, these are all really important parts of, of just transition. Globally, New Zealand is a leader. You were one of the first countries to commit to just transition. And you were also the first to say that you were going to have a concrete plan with investments and new jobs for this region, for a region that is going to be affected by some of the changes we need to make in order to respond to climate change. Um, maybe more importantly though, uh, we really need this leadership internationally on climate action and just transition and inequality. And we also need leadership and good examples on recognizing the sovereignty and rights of indigenous peoples, both in this kind of process, but also more generally. I know that you've gotten some help along the way from New Zealand unions, and I really want to say how much we appreciate their role in the international union movement. They have been very generous with their time with other unions, explaining what you're doing here and showing what's possible when unions are working with iwi, with employers, and with the government. Now, New Zealand is not alone. So in the last year or so, we have seen uh, what almost feels like an explosion of countries and other actors who are working on just transition. Germany, Canada, Spain, the Netherlands, um, Scotland, but also states and regions in Australia. We're going to hear from Jay about that. Even in the United States, the state of New York and California and South Africa, all are committing to just transition and starting out on these same kinds of processes that you have here in New Zealand. You've got a head start, but you're also not by yourselves. Interestingly, I know we have a lot of employers in the room, and I want to say that we are also seeing employers, businesses committing to just transition, both as a sort of principle, but also in practice. You'll have heard of some of them. Unilever, for example, has committed to just transition and is working on a plan for their employees, uh, which will also probably include some commitments in the supply chain. 
but also two of the world's largest renewable energy companies, Enel, which is based in Italy, but is a renewable multinational, Ersted, which was the Danish state utility, is now the world's largest developer of offshore wind. They have committed to just transition, and we're now, as unions, turning that into collective bargaining agreements for workers in the countries where they operate. Even the International Chamber of Commerce, not necessarily the most progressive organization of employers, has also said that they too are committed to just transition. We will see what that means. Um, these are substantial commitments at different scales. I should say, for example, that here in Auckland, unions, the Auckland city government, uh, Auckland Transport are starting discussions on just transition and in other cities around the world, cities are, major cities are also looking at how you can have climate targets that are good for working class and poor people, that are good for the environment and that create lots of decent jobs. But at a different scale, just to mention, just to mention this commitment, commitment for the future not yet turned into law and budgets that Germany has made. Germany is the world's fourth largest economy. It's heavily industrialized, um, it's export driven, it produces a lot of power and is going to transform its power sector so that it is 65% renewable uh, by 2035. It's also going to completely phase out coal-fired power. And that commitment came out of a process that's going to sound familiar for after what you, what you heard this morning. That was a process with a government commission that included regional and federal government, it included unions, it included employers, it included environmental organizations. And together, in very, very hard discussions, they crafted a plan for the energy sector that if they're able to deliver on it, if they get through the political process, is going to create thousands and thousands of good new jobs for workers in regions that today are dominated by coal-fired power, is going to transform the electricity sector, and is going to make sure that what today are energy regions will be energy regions of the future, but also with zero emissions. A big part of this plan that I want to highlight is the regional investment that's being discussed. So again, if all goes as planned, we're talking about 40 billion euro over 20 years in these regions that today are very dependent on coal-fired power and coal mining. And a lot of that investment is going to be going into infrastructure. So high-speed rail, decent roads, public transportation, broadband. Other parts of it will be going into soft infrastructure. So that's schools, hospitals, um, research institutions, vocational institutions, all of the things that make it good for people to live, stay, and work in the community, and for employers to stay there too. So we're hearing some of this today in the announcements from the government and in the roadmap, and I just want to say that that is, that backbone of investment in the region is going to be really, really important. Um, I can go through all of these examples one by one, but we'd be here for a while. So I don't, I, I'm not gonna do that, but I will just try to say something about the, sort of what is best practice in just transition. And I, w I will be in some ways just reinforcing and echoing what we've heard this morning because we've already heard a lot of it. The most important thing is to put people at the center. So as a climate activist and a trade unionist, I care a lot about climate targets but we can have climate targets that put people first and that are good for work, working class and poor people. And that includes things like uh, affordable, accessible, reliable, and safe public transportation. It includes decent jobs, skills training, and education for young people, making sure that people who are today locked out of decent work get good jobs. It can include affordable, reliable, safe and clean energy, electricity for people. It can include clean air, which is something that we need more and more in our major cities. And it can include energy efficient and affordable social housing so that people have good places to live, they can move around in their communities and live good lives all while we bring down emissions. Another backbone of just, just transition is social protection. 
So when we're going to go through these massive changes that we heard about this morning, changes not only in New Zealand, but in the global economy, people need to feel secure. They need income support when they're out of work. They need pensions so they can have a dignified old age. They need good health care. They need affordable or free public services. They need good education. All of these things are part of a good social protection system. They will be critical. When making these plans, the process you've had in Taranaki seems great, right? So you have iwi, you have unions, you have employers, you have, you have government, you have community leaders at the table and making a plan on the way forward. But those plans have to be more than plans. In order for people to really trust that as they move from a job in the oil and gas sector, which coming from Norway and being a former oil sector worker myself, it is a good job. They need to know that their new job is going to, is going to be really good. So you need to have active labor market policies as well as just economic diversification. There needs to be retaining, retraining, and redeployment of workers in existing enterprises. People need to be retrained, their skills mapped and matched with new jobs so that they're not just left to themselves or at the mercy of the market as we go through this transformation. It will be really, really important to make sure that the new jobs are good jobs because another thing that we see all over the world is that the jobs that have built our prosperity, including in fossil fuels, those jobs tend to be better jobs than the ones that are being created in new sectors. We must have decent labor standards. People must make prevailing wage. We must have a living wage. They must have training. They must have workplace health and safety. For older workers who are not going to be able to reskill, people who may have started work at age 16 and are now ready for retirement, they need a bridge to pension. And for these younger workers, they need a guarantee of new jobs. It's not enough to tell them that the job might be there in the future. So I want to end with three things. First of all, we really want you to succeed here in Taranaki in New Zealand because your leadership is important, but your success is going to be even more important. We need to be able to show that this idea of just transition, where we have a few examples, industrial examples from the last few decades, in different countries, that this is a real thing and this is how we're going to tackle climate change in a way that is good for people. We need to be sure that you not only diversify the economy here in Taranaki or in other parts of the country, but that workers are accompanied in this process of moving from one sector to another so that no one really is left behind and so that people who today are marginalized, not able to access good jobs, that they get the good jobs. The last thing I want to say is just to the employers. So as a trade unionist, it might be weird that I'm reaching out to employers, but we actually depend on each other. You depend on your workforce, and we depend on you to provide good jobs, to transform your companies in time, to make good decisions with us about what the future of those companies is going to be. You have a key role in these discussions. You also need to play, pay, you also need to do your part. You're going to need to invest in new technology, skills for your workforce, new business models and products in order to have prosperous enterprises in the future. We don't want you to shut down. We want you to transform and take your workers with you. We need you to retain, retrain and redeploy us and to give us good jobs in the future. We need you also to pay your fair share of tax. Because we also have seen in place after place now that it's one thing when you are having a just transition for a smaller part of the economy, but to make these really big changes, government cannot pay for and execute this transformation alone. You will also need to be along with us. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to answering any of the questions you may have on Slido or afterwards. I'll be around both days.
ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to this interesting and important summit. I would like to present the important elements of a socially acceptable development of the rural area in Germany. The rural area was at the beginning of the coal mining, uh, a rural, sparsely populated region. Only uh, uh, at the River Ruhr there were some small settlements and the city of Bochum, nowadays a city, was a small village. Now where came the workers from? Workers were needed and they came from all over Germany. They came from uh, all European regions and as a result the Ruhr area became a melting pot of cultures with a cooperative mentality. I mention this because this was one of the reasons why after the... Was I too quick? No, it works. Uh, after the Second World War, the trade unions uh, called for greater code determination in companies. Almost simultaneously with the creation of the European Union of Steel and Coal, the participation of employees and super in supervisory boards and management boards of iron and steel companies was introduced. This law allowed employees to participate in investment and personal decisions as well as in decommissioning decisions. This resulted in a reliable partnership. Social peace in the regions was maintained even in difficult situations. In 1957, over 600,000 people were still employed in the German coal mining industry. A sales crisis started in 1957 and to prevent from a collapse, the government introduced subsidies and the first early retirement schemes for miners. Nevertheless, in the year 1970, the number of mines had halved and the number of miners decreased to about 250,000. Subsidies were increasingly criticized and as a consequence of this, uh, massive uh, subsidy cuts were decided in 1997. This is why I start uh, my chart, uh, my figures of, of this chart in 1997. Despite of this difficult situation, nevertheless, it was decided that young people should uh, be hired as trainees because the coal industry was a very important provider of apprenticeship places in the region. Early retirement still was the most important instrument, but education and training became more and more important. Almost 80, no, 87,000 jobs were eliminated within 20 years in a socially acceptable way. As the coal mining industry did not become economically viable, it was decided in the year 2007 to phase out the coal industry completely by the end of the year 2018. And this year had been chosen only because this was the only way to avoid redundancies. As a consequence of the decommissioning decision, it was possible to transfer uh, the assets of the mining company, RAG, on the, on the left side in the chart, uh, to a foundation. The former owners of this company sold their shares for one symbolic euro and the assets enabled the foundation to finance the inherited liabilities of the industry. The foundation also promotes education, science and culture in the mining regions. The instruments of our personal policy had been continuously improved. Uh, not every miner had the chance to work in the mining, uh, sorry, in, in the energy sector. Uh, we developed a new instrument called the Job Explorer employees were willing to give very personal information to their company. In this way, the right candidates could be found for the jobs acquired. For example, many miners uh, who were volunteers in a fire brigade were transferred to the airport fire brigade in Dortmund. So we may say we had a labor office of our own. Universities were founded in the Ruhr area from 1965. Before this time, there was not even one 
university in the rural area where millions of people already lived at that time. Uh, the idea was that the educational level of the workforce and uh, to cope with the shortage of skilled workers uh, in Germany should be solved via creating new universities. As a consequence, now the rural area is uh, the university uh, the, uh, developed to the densest university landscape in Europe. The town of Bochum, in the meantime, uh, also had a university founded in 1965. This town was particularly hit uh, by the shutdowns of mines. The no longer needed areas uh, were used to offer these areas to General Motors and they established a completely new automotive factory. But it was soon understood that uh, we had a new bottleneck. The bottleneck uh, were the, the areas where we could, uh, which we could offer to uh, new investors. And therefore, uh, rehabilitation and development of new areas became an important topic. The mining company itself, uh, 40 years ago, founded a company uh, with only this, ta uh, this task. You can see on the left how we developed a former mine site where you can find everything from a hydrogen center to leisure activities. And to the right, you can see a former waste dump in the town of Dortmund, which is now a logistics center. So even if the development in the rural area was uh, more like a, a gliding flight than a nosedive, the economic development lagged behind the rest of Germany. This is uh, why it was decided to look for other instruments and uh, the idea was that art and culture also could help to make the rural area worth living in. I former industrial areas were redesigned uh, in a future program and one example is that uh, a design center moved in a former boiler house and this boiler house was rebuilt by the well-known architect Sir Norman Foster. In the year 2001, this site became the UNESCO World Heritage Site and in the year, year 2010, the whole rural area became a European capital of culture. During this time, more than two million people visited this site. Another idea to solve the problems of the region was the so-called Ruhr Initiative Roundtable. One of the co-founders, a cardinal, called himself the Ruhr Bishop. Important business leaders, the chairman of the mining union and others were involved in the founding. One example, the, they introduced the Ruhr Piano Festival. In the meantime, uh, living legends and rising stars give us the honor of participating. The current flagship pro uh, project of this initiative is the so-called Innovation City Ruhr. Uh, the town of Bottrop, which uh, is the place where the last closed mine in 2018 was located, uh, is uh, the conversion to a climate-friendly city. They decided from the time span from 2010 to 2020 to halve the CO2 emissions. 37% of reduction already had been realized within five years. This shows that a turnaround from bottom to top is possible. They started a dialogue with all the inhabitants of the town and, and mobilized potentials to reduce the CO2 emissions. Despite these efforts, the rural region is, economic, is, sorry, is economically underperformed. One example, in the wealthiest region in Germany, near Munich, people earn twice as much per capita as in the rural area city of Gelsenkirchen, which is the poorest town in Germany. As a consequence, the North Rhine-Westphalian government decided to give a start signal to the so-called Ruhr Conference. But this conference is not a conference where uh, the business leaders and the union leaders uh, are sitting at a table, but it's rather a process of change. People are involved in this process via an online forum where they discuss 20 thematic forums and they reach from science to education and green infrastructure. Well, if I should summarize, I would say 
there are important uh, instruments which had been developed, but key was that we introduced the co-determination system in Germany for the uh, mining and uh, steel industry and the spirit of cooperation in the rural area. A lot still has to be done, uh, especially training and education and especially also we have to ensure that young people in the rural area, regardless of gender, place of residence, religion and origin, have the best po po uh, possible education opportunities. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, hello, my name is Jay Weatherall. I'm uh, the former Premier of South Australia. Um, I like to call myself a recovering politician. Um, I want to tell you a little about South Australia's journey to decarbonise its economy and what we learned uh, and try and link that with um, hopefully some, some observations about what might assist a just transition here in this country. I suppose it began uh, in a way uh, through some pretty existential threats. Uh, we live in the driest state in the driest inhabited continent. And just as a reminder, this year, on the 24th of January, we had the hottest day on record, 46.6 degrees. And one of our regional cities had a 49.5 degree day. Um, and so, so that, that's a, a significant imperative. But we also had an economy which was undergoing very significant changes. With the globalisation and the, the freeing up of product and financial markets, we saw uh, a state economy which had been very much based around manufacturing being belted around by those international forces. So we're losing lots of jobs and opportunities. And so when we survey what our strengths were, we realised that we had an opportunity to take advantage of our excellent wind resources and solar resources to push very deeply into a new form of energy generation. Uh, so we had 0% renewable energy in 2002 when we came into government. And when we left last year, it's 50.5% renewable energy. So a massive transformation in the course of 16 years. Uh, and um, that was important because we, we also saw that as the technology of the future, uh, but also an opportunity to get, uh, because we could see that the world was needing decarbonise, to be a first mover, there were opportunities for us to, to gain uh, the the economic advantages by developing those technologies. And also the, the, the other prospect of being one of, um, we were one of the highest cost energy uh, producers in the nation to actually go to be the lowest cost energy producer through renewable energy, which opened up a whole range of other opportunities around the industrialization of high energy intensive industry. So that, that was why we did it. And we pushed into it um, also, uh, at a range of levels, we, we sought to, to work across every domain, whether it was transport, waste, energy systems, uh, our building energy, across every domain of, of society. And we, we sought to make partnerships with local government, with the business community, uh, and uh, with um, uh, really all of the, the sectors that could assist us to make that transformation. We tried to make a partnership with a federal government and for a short time we were able to when we had a federal Labor government, there was the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme that was then quickly repealed when a Conservative government came in. And what we found through our international advocacy uh, is that uh, when we lost our Commonwealth partner, we realised that much of the efforts in relation to climate action were occurring at a sub-national level. So we could see that there are opportunities still to take action. In fact, most of the world's action on climate change is occurring at the sub-national government level, local government and regional governments. And we wanted to project ourselves as a state that had a clean green image. And this is very similar to New Zealand in the sense that this becomes a competitive advantage. Come and be part of our community because we're projecting the values of a clean green place. But we, we we were confronted with some very significant forces. The sectoral interests, which were in the fossil fuel industry, fought back very strongly. 
And so there was a very significant event which really caused a massive conflict. We had a statewide blackout. And the statewide blackout was caused through a cyclone ripping out uh, really the, the spine of our electricity transmission system. But because we had a very high penetration of renewable energy, the fossil fuel industry used their proxies to blame our renewable energy for that. And so we had everybody piling onto us, social media, a federal government, government that was, was backed up by the fossil fuel industry. And they attacked us mercilessly. So as a state government, we felt very vulnerable. But my message um, really is this. We stood up to those attacks and we resisted them. But what happened is, interestingly, the community ran to our defence. There was massive support for renewable energy. And we found that we were able to be sustained in that. And something else we did, we, we actually used the crisis associated with that to actually design and accelerate, in a sense, our push into this sector. So, uh, in a way that, um, uh, and it's one of the key messages I want to communicate, is that um, big gains can be made um, by involving the community in the decisions that affect their lives. And that's just not the uh, everyday, ordinary um, Australians, New Zealanders, but also the business community and indeed the international community. When we were responding to this crisis associated with the statewide blackout and we were seeking to design an energy plan that was resilient, um, we, we opened up and we, we invited uh, essentially people to contribute. Uh, and we received many unsolicited bids and we did something a bit unusual for governments. We went up and we stood next to the companies that were making these unsolicited bids and we showcased them. That's quite different from a procurement process that usually requires us to stand at, at arm's length. But through that process, it led to so much additional attention uh, that we saw other international unsolicited bids come into to South Australia, most famously the bid by Elon Musk to create the world's biggest lithium-ion battery, which ultimately won uh, a procurement process and is now in place and has actually revolutionised our electricity grid, not just ours, but indeed the nation's. So I suppose my message to you is that this is a really complex question, this question of transition. Uh, there are many winners and losers, uh, but involving people in the decisions that affect their lives and inviting uh, a deliberative process is critical to this. And we've, in South Australia, pioneered these uh, deliberative processes where we invite, um, really, the community to be involved in a dialogue. And this involves recalibrating the relationship between experts and citizens. And um, I, I, I just want to... Um, uh, to leave you with one anecdote, which is not a South Australian one, it's something I picked up uh, when we were doing some work on an international basis with the United Nations about this deliberative um, process, and it involved Uganda. The Ugandan government decided to make a decision to remove a whole bunch of people from a high-risk area in terms of climate. Uh, the community resisted that because it was going to cause a lot of disruption, and so they involved a deliberative process where they got the experts in and spoke to the community. What the community said is, give us more information. Give us, recalibrate the data so we have very high risk, moderately high risk, and uh, lesser high risk areas, if you like. Uh, there were some mountainous regions. Uh, people had very much their communities were connected to that lifestyle. There were other parts of the community that was used for growing food and their economic well-being was connected to that. And there were some areas where they designated that there might be opportunities to still live in these areas. So the community said, we'll vacate the very high-risk area, we'll farm in the moderately high-risk area, and we'll rebuild communities that are suited to the particular climactic conditions on the edge of the farming communities. This was critically important because the politics was driving this as well. If you split up communities where leaders have their constituencies in a certain area, that is always going to cause resistance to change. And through this process of dialogue between communities and experts, they came up with an, a more sophisticated solution 
than the government experts could themselves come up with. So th this process of dialogue, of recalibrating the, the role of the expert and make them as servants of the citizen rather than actually as dictating and determining outcomes is a critical element, I think, in the dialogue here. And w the wonderful thing you've got here, which we don't have in our country, is you have a consensus about the need to take action. So that's a very good starting point. The second uh, thing that you have here is you have good commitments to deliberative processes, like we've just seen discussed earlier. Uh, but I, I think this is the way forward, um, because th the truth is you have to stick together a progressive coalition for change. The only way, you can't have people that want to take action on climate change here and workers that are being uh, disrupted through the changes over here. Um, if you split that coalition in that way, you'll never have a consensus that's capable of taking action on climate change. The politics of the situation demand that you knit those two constituencies together. Um, and um, uh, it, I've, there's more I could say, but I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in New Zealand, uh, uh, particularly to be with you today at this event, so thank you. Um, I represent uh, ARAP, which is a global engineering and management consultancy, about uh, 16,000 people globally. Um, we've been known for things like this, the Sydney Opera House High Speed Rail in the UK, but more, more locally, we've been working with our Auckland-based team and our international team with the Ports of Auckland on their hydrogen uh, pilot program. So some really exciting work there, um, learning from doing. Um, I lead our global energy systems uh, work at AREP, uh, exploring the ways that multiple energy vectors uh, come together, be they electricity, gas, uh, heat, um, and, and increasingly how they're becoming integrated with one another. They no longer live in glorious isolation uh, of, of one another. Um, just before I go on, if the, the picture on the screen at the moment is, um, is a coal power plant uh, called Ratcliffe on Soar in the centre of the UK. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but I just wanted to point out the, the photo while we were here. Not, not only are the energy vectors increasingly linked with one another, but they're also more intertwined with uh, the, the demand side of things, be that uh, transport or, or the thermal side of things or the, or the electrical side, but also integrating increasingly with, with transport and with water and with urban systems. Um, I think we're gradually moving to a point where we agree on 2050 targets. I th the, the UK Climate Change Commission came out last week with a 275-page report to the UK government saying we need to move from 80% to 100% decarbonisation uh, by 2050. So that's being considered at the moment. So, so at the moment, New Zealand is, uh, is ahead of that. Um, I like to think of the challenge as not where we want to go to, but, but actually how we get there. And I, I call it uh, going, going loco. How do we get from the, the lowest cost to, to low carbon or, or low greenhouse uh, gas emissions. In this, in this sense, cost is, is societal as well as monetary costs are very much aligned with the just uh, transitions agenda. How can we make the journey sustainable and equitable? And if we think about the, the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, SDG 10, reduced inequalities, is a key one. And of course, se uh, seven in terms of affordable and clean energy is, is also important, as is 13 on climate uh, action. So I think there's a oppor real opportunity to, to flip this idea of cost to opportunity and hearing, hearing that uh, uh, very clearly uh, this morning. So we've been working on a, f on a number of projects, but I was just going to illustrate uh, three uh, very quickly this morning. Uh, one is the Ratcliffe on Soar and, and the, the, the uh, possibilities that that opens up uh, in terms of just transition, but also the strategic options that they would like to take. I'll touch on some circular economy work we did for uh, NL, looking at their assets uh, in, in Italy. And then I'll touch on a thing called uh, fostering for the energy revolution, which is a UK government uh, uh, approach. So, so Ratcliffe on Soar is a 2000 megawatt uh, coal fired power plant in, in Nottinghamshire in the centre of the UK. It was built in the, uh, in the early 1960s and uh, commissioned in, in 1968. So just to give you a feel for how long ago that was, there were still steam trains running on the tracks in the UK in 1968. 
Um, Ratcliffe's operated consistently since then, but it's now coming up to the point uh, where it's ready for de decommissioning. Actually, it's a bit of a scary thought, but when I was just preparing this, I was thinking, if I were a coal plant, I'd probably be coming ready for decommissioning about now. So Radcliffe has been, has been forced by European legislation uh, you know, and, and societal demand to, to, to close down uh, by the latest uh, 2050. So we've been working very closely with them to, to understand how that might be a, a sensible uh, transition. Um, in, incidentally, the UK, when I, when, I, when I made a few notes a couple of weeks ago, the UK had operated for 90, 90 hours uh, without any coal power generation, first time for about, uh, about 50 years. But when I looked yesterday, that record had gone up to 125 hours. So things are changing quite rapidly. It might seem small, but actually over 50 years without, with continuous coal generation, that's uh, quite an achievement. So we've been working with, uh, with Uniper, the German utility who, who, who own Ratcliffe, looking at strategic options for the site, uh, for, the, for the employees, uh, for the community, and also making sure that there is a business opportunity and maximizing that business opportunity at the same time. Um, we've been looking through a number of strands, but decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization are, are key among those. We're also looking at the context of, of that site in terms of the energy literate staff and the uh, supply chain that lies behind uh, that, that organization. The fantastic connectivity uh, that the site has, it's right, we'll, be, we'll be right next door to the high speed rail line, HS2 in the UK, it's right next door to some of the motorway network, but not only the physical interconnection, it has the digital connection or can have the digital connect connection and is a secure site. So then we think of a few of the building blocks that we could bring together. Those uh, which are aligned directly with energy uh, are in red on, on this diagram, so combined cycle gas, hydrogen uh, production and storage, solar, wind, uh, battery storage, for instance. And then in the light blue, we've got the large energy users, automotive, pharmaceutical, chemical, for example. And then in the blue, uh, the strategically aligned, so research, university, so again, what we were hearing about uh, this morning. Non-energy activity is in the dark blue, so things like data centers, things like leisure and resorts and housing. So when we bring those together, this particular example actually is where we brought them together um, in an industrial context and said, what would happen if we built, brought together a number of different blocks with the aim of, uh, of being an industrial cluster and so that they can play off each other and we can get maximum advantage out of the, the coherent whole, uh, if you like. And we did a number of other uh, different scenarios. I work, in, I work for NL in Italy was slightly different. Here we were, we were taking circular economy principles, um, looking at the, the, the social side, the land use, the employment, the governance, uh, environmental in terms of energy, water consumption, emissions, the financial, the business attractiveness, the value creation, the investment return, and the technical, material reuse, infrastructure reuse, and, and equipment reuse. So we're really trying to achieve the highest possible value uh, for, from the community and the assets, but perhaps more importantly, uh, for the people and community. Picking up on a, on a slightly different angle, um, I thought I'd just touch on uh, prospering from the energy revolution, which is part of the UK government's industrial strategy challenge fund. I'm fortunate to sit on the advisory board uh, for this with UK government. Um, and really what it's all about is looking how UK PLC can prepare itself to both uh, create value inside the UK, but also export, export value and recognizing that um, by bringing together many parts of the energy system and, uh, and again learning by doing, we can, we can really develop a great knowledge base, great IP and, uh, and we, can, we can sell that. So this, this doesn't need to be a story of doom and gloom, it can be a very positive uh, story. So maximizing that economic recovery, particularly looking at uh, scalable and replicable uh, solutions. So, in summary, we need to, need to plan early, and clearly in Taranaki that, that is the case. We need to look for opportunity, we need to embrace the future, and we need to build upon the legacy uh, that we have. So I'll leave it there for the moment uh, and look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks. Right, thank you all for that. Let's have a conversation based on some of the questions that have been coming through on Slido. I'm going to stand up so I can actually see them. Can you bring those mm -hmm. questions up again? 
Okay, so we've had a range of different uh, questions coming through. Oh, I can see them down here, of course, um, from Slido, and some of them are actually being saved for other sessions so that the questions are directed to the right people. Um, I just want to start with uh, one of the more recent ones that has come through uh, on the app. Uh, and this is, this is a question to Jay, and Ben asks, what would you have done differently in South Australia's transition to renewables if you had your time again? Well, I think we, um, I think I probably would have made the case for why uh, more uh, powerfully and, and significantly. Um, I mean, I think in governments what we tend to do too often is to get on with the what, and we, we whereas if you spend a little bit more time on the why, um, you can, I think, um, it can assist because then you, in fact, usually the answers fall out pretty simply once you've you've got a, a really solid appreciation for why you're doing something. So, in the case, I mean, we had a, a powerful example where we where there was some challenges, and that was the closure of a coal-fired power station mm. in Port Augusta, uh, which was the last uh, coal-fired power station in the state uh, and it shut. It had it was using very low quality coal lignite. Um, it was very expensive and its reserves were being depleted. Uh, but that community, and it closed suddenly because it was a private operator, that community felt very threatened about that when it happened. And I don't think we'd adequately prepared the groundwork. Um, Subsequently, though, um, we, we were able to make some changes which I think restored some trust in the community. There's a, a, a prospect of a solar thermal plant uh, to use the transmission infrastructure that's there. There's uh, the nation's largest greenhouse gas sundrop farms, about 20 hectares of uh, solar desalination, and a range of solar, therm uh, solar uh, PV projects and also a pumped hydro project. So it's that ambition, that that community has an ambition to still be an energy uh, mm. producer, but a renewable energy hub. Uh, but we we sort of did that off the back foot. If if we'd been more proactive, uh, perhaps that community would have felt less threatened by uh, the very sudden and dramatic shutting of, a, of that um, that plant. Let's jump into some of these questions. Um, before we move on to our next session. Samantha, how do we ensure companies go beyond greenwashing? That's the concern <laughs> for a lot of people. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, one way that we can ensure that companies go beyond greenwashing is through strong collective bargaining agreements that include real commitments for transforming the company, having dialogue with workers in that process, and making sure that the jobs are good. So we have examples of that where we're negotiating agreements with employers that include funds for training, sometimes pooled funds from different employers that include commitments to retaining, retraining, and redeploying workers, and that also have a process of dialogue with workers about how the company is going to transform. On the issue of how can you make sure that companies are actually cutting their emissions, right? There's a role there for investors in the financial sector, I would say, as well as for government. Because a company that is, again, a companies that are not able to transform and bring down emissions in a relatively short period of time, they are not going to be around for the future. And so they, their board should hold them to account, their investors should hold them to account, government can hold them to account, but also their workers, employees, and unions, we will hold them to account. To sure. that, um, and just in continuing on with the, from that perspective, in in Australia we have very powerful industry superannuation funds, yes. where workers are represented through their unions. And what I've found fascinating recently is just been this increased interest in what's called ESG, environmental, social, and governance risk, and the fact that investors are now beginning to insist that companies minimise those risks. So if you're a highly carbon exposed company, um, you know, investors through workers through their superannuation funds are going to say, we don't want to be exposed to that risk. So mm. 
th there can be real discipline imposed, you know, by workers through their superannuation funds as well. So that yeah. that's, I think, a really important emerging area. Yeah, I mean, we've been open to that as uh, organisations like uh, RE100, Renewable Energy 100, so companies that are signing up to say, we will be 100% renewable energy. In fact, I was in, uh, in Australia, in Sydney, uh, about uh, in, in November last year, with the RE100 team, and we had five new companies pretty much sign up on the day uh, to RE100. So I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot of pull for development. It's not all about us. Let's take a look at some more of these questions from Slido. I want to acknowledge the question from Sam, which I think is the most uh, upvoted uh, question on the app, and I'm aware, and we need to acknowledge that uh, none of the four of you are from New Zealand, but it is an important question in this context. The question is, Māori are treaty partners, shouldn't true partnerships be based on consensus, not consultation? Would anyone like to respond to that? In a previous job, I worked in the Arctic, where we, um, in some countries, First Nations have treaty rights, sovereign rights over territories, rights to natural resources and to decisions that are being made about them. And so that's a pretty good principle, also consistent with international law, with the ILO Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that um, where you have sovereignty and rights over natural resources, you then also have rights about how decisions are made. I think that's all I, I can say without the, without knowing more about exactly the system here. In a local context, would anyone else like to add? I, mean, I, I would add that, and, and it was mentioned in terms of the Taranaki 2050, mm. it's about bringing a range, of, a range of ideas and discussing those openly. It's not about bringing a solution and saying, this is the solution, do you agree with it? So I think changing that narrative round is a very valuable exercise of that whole community engagement. So what is the spirit then that these parties need to bring to the table? Because I guess the fear is what you end up with is a situation where there is token consultation or there are parties that do not feel that they have an adequate stake in that conversation and are therefore feeling perhaps marginalised or less likely to act uh, consistently with mm. the plan as it ultimately shapes up. How do we avoid that? May I give you an example? I just mentioned that the former mining town Bottrop became the so-called innovation city and uh, the we realized 37% CO2 reduction within five years. Mm. How could we manage this? The easy answer is they talked to the inhabitants. So there were, of course there was not a must to, uh, to, to accept that you are involved in this process, but most of the inhabitants, they, they, they uh, enjoyed this uh, consultation and as a result, uh, they invested in insulation because uh, they, they were offered the best uh, solution for their home and also for their budget, which is very important. Uh, for example, elderly people are, are not uh, ready to spend half of their savings. So if you really give everybody a chance to be involved, uh, bottom up, not top down, not just decide, but uh, really inform everybody, then you, you are amazed w w what you can achieve. 37% CO2 reduction in five mm. years. And that sets up us up nicely for this uh, question about education which has dis disappeared from the screen but there are a couple of questions on Slido around how do we actually raise a, a generation that has a level of competency around this stuff, not just the language but the concepts, they're able to pick it up and run with it if we're really thinking about a long term plan here, that we raise children and young people who are willing to uh, carry this mantle forward. In your countries and in your cultural context, how important has education been? Education, so access to high quality, free, universal public education, including vocational training, is absolutely key, right? I live in a country, let's hear it for, let's hear it for education, educators and teachers, but also, also for vocational institutes. I live in a country where university education is free at point of service. And that has meant that you have lots of people who are today getting professional educations who couldn't other, who would be locked out of that in other countries, for example, the UK. But also the availability of vocational training, including certification of skills, so that blue collar jobs can be decent and high quality jobs too. Not everyone has to become a lawyer. And where, right? So, 
where you have a system that recognizes the skills of workers and allows people to get upgrades to their education and skills throughout their working lives so that they can take on board and use these new technologies, that's a system that is going to be successful. And I think um, when you're talking about young people entering the workforce, if the jobs that you're going to are good jobs, if you have security of contract, you don't have a zero hours contract, you're gonna make a decent wage. You know that you're gonna be getting skills upgrades. You're gonna be in an industry where your work is valued. You're going to be a lot more likely to want to seek training for those jobs than you are if your future is in an Amazon warehouse. I interviewed uh, a woman called Kyla Colbin, who many of you will know recently, uh, she works for uh, Boma Global and she's a social entrepreneur and a range of other things but she says you know we really need to get back to this question of what is the purpose of education is the purpose of education simply to get you into a job at the end of 13 years sitting in a classroom or do we want to create a more well-rounded uh, bunch of young people who have a wider set of priorities and desires and have agency to go out and create change in the world so in Australia Jay how are you guys doing this? Are you doing it any better than us? Or how are you raising young people who have a level of literacy, I guess, around these really complex mm. concepts? I mean, I, look, I don't know what the situation is here in New Zealand, but the, the my experience of it to young school-aged children is that they're powerfully engaged in, in this question of climate change. They're incredibly ethically uh, motivated to take action on climate change. They're incredibly well-informed. Uh, and modern education systems, I think really for probably for decades now, have been encouraging critical thinking. So I don't think they, I don't think um, young people uh, uh, accept what, what, what is simply given to them anymore. I think they're encouraged, properly so, to critique information and to be, to be highly sceptical about, um, about authority, which is very uncomfortable if you happen to be a politician. But I think it's actually a, it's actually a good thing. Um, it, it makes, I think, the democracies much more demanding. Uh, but I think, you know, really, this is why ultimately I come back to this point, we need deliberative processes. Because there are so many people out there that want to be part of the discussion. They want to be engaged. And, you know, what, what we've heard is that so much of the action that can be taken on climate change is actually individual behavioural change. So you can actually motivating people to take action, communities to, to, to act, to change behaviour is a very powerful way in which we can make a contribution. We're out of time and we're going to hear from local leaders responding to what you've told us over the last hour, but just quickly, starting with you, Samantha, just a 10 second takeaway of what is the main lesson that you, are, that you have brought to our country that you want the people in this room to get? Your main tip or your nugget that you would like people to take away from this? Put people at the centre both in terms of your actions on climate change, but also the process for getting to those actions and delivering them. Do things that are good for working class and poor people. Have EWE unions, employers, and government at the table. Make the plans and be sure that you deliver them. Because if you don't succeed on this one, if people don't get the jobs that they hope to get in this transition, it will be hard to come back and do it again. Thank you very much for your time. All four of you, a round of applause for them, please. Thanks.